Welcome back to Module 8. We're going to start on Chapter 5 with Module 8, and we're going to continue on through Module 9 and Module 10, doing different pieces of the chapter. The chapter covers all of the current assets, but in this module, all we're going to look at will be cash and short-term securities. So let's talk a little bit about what cash and short-term securities are. If you look in your book on page 138, they have for you a financial statement. Specifically at the top, they have a balance sheet with highlighted current assets. And you'll notice the first two things that are listed on that balance sheet are cash and cash equivalents and short-term marketable securities. Those are our two topics for this module. So let's talk a little bit about what cash is. Cash, you often think of as what you have in your pocket, your change, your dollar bills. In a business, it's basically the same thing. It's the cash they have available to them to use. But if you think about a merchandise, merchandising operation, they have a cash register. So all the cash that's in the cash register or the multiple cash registers is included in their cash account. In addition, most companies have what they call petty cash, which is often just a box in somebody's drawer where they keep track of a little bit of cash to make minor expenditures. For example, sometimes they have to run out and get a special kind of marker at the last minute for a presentation. It's only going to cost a couple of dollars, so they don't want to go out and write a check or incur any kind of expense, so they simply use petty cash for those types of expenses. Someone keeps track of that cash in the drawer and they take a receipt every time that money is used for a purchase. Periodically, the petty cash is reimbursed, they put some more money in it, they take those receipts and enter them in the accounting records as expenses. Another piece of cash that you'll find in most companies are what they call undeposited cash receipts. Now this can be monies that they've received in the mail through checks for people who've paid their bills. It may be customers who have come into the business and have written checks there and they have them on hand but they haven't deposited them. Those are cash receipts that have not been deposited into the bank but they're still cash the company has that's available to them. Additionally, they have their bank account. And this is where most companies keep a majority of their cash. They will have at least one checking account and probably some sort of, of marketable uh, deposit account or a CD in the bank or some kind of savings account where they keep their money for short-term investments. All of their bank accounts need to be reconciled in other words, agree on what the amount is in the bank, and they're entered in the cash account. You also have something that's called commercial paper that's included in the cash account. Commercial paper is a loan that one company accepts from another company. Companies that are very secure, large companies that don't have any credit problems, can sell their debt short term in something that's called commercial paper and it's easily exchanged for cash. It's sort of like a note that travels around pretty easily. The interest rate is fairly high, but it's a way for companies to get money for the short term. So you can see from that slide that you just saw all the different types of cash that are included in that cash account. You add up all of the cash that's available to the company, and that's the $1 amount that's shown on the balance sheet. So realize there's more than one thing included in the cash account. It's not just their checking account. It's often several checking accounts because many companies have a checking account for payroll, a checking account for accounts payable, and perhaps another checking account for a specific purpose. So they will have maybe 3 to 10 to 15 checking accounts. All of them are added together with their petty cash, their undeposited cash receipts, their commercial paper. All of that is totaled up into the cash account. Cash, if you think about it, is one of the most easily transferred assets that a company has. It's very easy to do away with cash, to simply stick it in your pocket and walk out the door. So in order to control cash, we have a number of what we call internal controls to cover all of our assets, but most specifically to worry about cash because it's so easily spent and easily can disappear from a firm. So what we have to do is to safeguard our cash, and we also safeguard our other assets like inventory 
and anything else we have that's easily taken from the firm without any trail. So we call that internal control. That's the way we keep track of our assets and keep them safe. There are two types of internal control. One is called financial control. Financial controls are the controls that we have to keep track of the actual financial side of our assets. For example, when a company collects cash, they will make sure that the person who actually receives the cash is not the same person that makes the journal entry into the books for the receipt of that cash. We call that separation of duties. In most cases, any time one person handles cash, that same person does not make the entries into the journals. For example, if you think about your credit card and how you make payments on your credit card, you tear off part of that bill, you write your check, you stick it with that piece of paper that you've torn off from the bill, and you mail it to a company. When the company gets it, they open the envelope, they take out the paper that says what you've paid, the part of your bill, and they take the check. The person who opens that writes down the amount of the check on a sheet of paper. They then pass the check to another person. A second person is the one who actually makes a journal entry for that check. The only thing the person who opens the envelope has is the receipt that you sent back with your check so that we have a separation of duties. We keep the person who's actually controlling the assets separate from the person who's actually making the journal entries. The same is true with your inventory. The person who has control over the inventory, who's in charge of it and is physically of, there to look after it, is different from the person who makes the entries in the books related to inventory. That way it keeps this inventory much safer, keeps cash much safer. Any of your assets that you're worried about, you separate the duties of the person who has control of the assets from the person who has the actual ability to make journal entries. In internal control, we also have a second, second set of controls that we call administrative controls. And these are like the policy and procedure manuals that most companies have that tell how certain activities take place. These re uh, cover such things as who can authorize that a bill be paid, who can authorize the hiring of an employee. And again, that person is usually separate from the person who actually makes any journal entries in the books from that particular activity. So you have a separation, you have an authentication process, and these add controls to your assets so that you don't lose things that you would like to keep around your company for, for business purposes. Now one of the major controls we have over cash is our checking account balance. We try to reconcile our checking account with the bank every month. And we call that a bank reconciliation. What we're going to do in here is called a two-column bank reconciliation. Now think about why your checkbook may be different from what the bank says that you have. Listed on that slide that you see in front of you are five of the different things that you may have that will cause differences between your balance and the bank's balance. Let's talk about each one of them. Deposits in transit are deposits that you have made, so you know about them, but the bank has not processed them yet, so they don't know about them. So they will not be on the bank's books, but they will be on your books. Outstanding checks are the same thing. They're not checks that are wonderful or anything like that. Checks that are outstanding mean they're checks that you've written and you know about them, but they have not been processed by the bank yet. So the bank does not know about those checks, but you do. Those are checks that are outstanding. The third item is bank service charges. These are charges the bank will hit you for, for things like printing your checks, uh, various other charges that they have for collecting things for you. They know about those charges, but usually you don't know about them until you get your bank reconciliation form. So you would not know and not have those on your books. The same thing with NSF checks. NSF checks are checks that have bounced, not sufficient fund checks. Often customers will give you a check for a bill that they owe. 
you will deposit that check thinking that it's a good check and you will enter it in your records as a deposit in cash. The bank, on the other hand, takes that check, they try to process it, they can't, so they do not include it in your bank account. So you've got it in your account, they don't. So you will find out about that when you get your bank statement. And finally, bank collections. For large companies, banks often will collect for the company. For example, there's often a note outstanding that the bank is in charge of collecting. They will collect that note and the interest, and they will post them to your account, but you won't know about it until you receive your bank statement. So it's on the bank's books, but it's not on your books. So those are five of the very easy things to think about that are differences between what you think you have in the bank and what the bank thinks you have in the bank. Your job is to reconcile those two to, so that you both agree that you have the same amount of cash in the bank. We call that a bank reconciliation. And in just a minute, we're going to work through a bank reconciliation and show you how that works through. The second thing that we're going to talk about in this chapter besides cash are short-term marketable securities. You may remember we talked about those earlier. We don't always want to have cash sitting around in our business because we don't get any return on it. So companies will often take their excess cash and invest it in things that have a fairly short life but will give them some return. For example, they will invest in U.S. Treasury securities or Treasury notes. Good, solid investments, there's very little risk, and they'll get a return on them. Commercial paper is the same way. Very little risk most of the time, easy to get at the bank, and it will give you some sort of return. Certificate of, of deposit at the bank are the same thing. You can get short-term certificates of deposit for three to six months. It's a way to invest your cash for the short term and get a return on it. Notice that when you do these types of investments, even though they're short term, you will get a return on them. And those securities that you buy are recorded at what you paid for them. Not what they're worth, what you paid for them. They're recorded at cost. The interest that you earn on them is accrued. In other words, you may have to make adjusting entries to debit interest receivable and credit interest revenue if your year ends between the time you bought the security and you've cashed it in and gotten your interest on it. A lot of companies will use these short-term investments as part of their cash management process because many companies have a busy season. For example, if you think about a toy store, a large majority of their business is done around the Christmas selling season. So they will sell a lot of stuff between the 1st of November and the 1st of January. Their selling season slacks off after that. It may pick up a little bit in the summer for summer toys and occasionally a little bit in the fall for back to school stuff. But their major selling time is that November to January time frame. So they'll receive a lot of cash at that point. Well, they'll need that cash to pay their wages, to pay their rent, to pay their utilities the rest of the year. So in order to have that cash available, they put it in short-term securities. They get a short-term return on it, and it's available to them when they need it. So that's part of their cash management. A lot of firms will have the same type of thing if you think about stores that do, uh, say, um, yard work, uh, that pr provide lawn mowers and stuff. Their busy season is in the spring. It may continue a little bit into the summer, but they probably don't sell much in the winter unless they sell snow blowers or something. So their major cash receipts will be at a specific time of the year, but they will have cash needs the entire year. And they use cash management to provide for that. So let's look at how we deal with cash security and the controls over cash by looking at a bank reconciliation. And I wanted to use problem 5-2 out of your textbook as an example. Problem 5-2 is in your book. It's on page 170, about a third of the way down the page. And it says, prepare a bank reconciliation as of the end of January using the following information. You know the January 31st bank statement shows a balance of 1860. You know there's a deposit in transit. You know there's some outstanding checks. There's some, been some interest that the bank has collected for you, but you don't know about it yet. 
There's a bank charge of $6 for checks that you had printed. You find in letter F that there's a mistake that you've made. You've written a check for one amount and entered it in your checkbook at another amount. You ever done that yourself? You probably realize that that happens occasionally. And then you have given to you the balance that's showing up in your cash account on your books. So let's see how we would go about making the bank reconciliation happen. How would we get our books to agree with the bank's books? Well, the first thing we do is start with the balance that the bank shows. The bank shows a balance of 1860. To that bank balance, we're going to add all the things and subtract all the things that the bank doesn't know about. For example, the bank doesn't know about the deposit in transit of $210. So we'll add that to the 1860. The bank does not know about the outstanding checks. These are checks you've written, but they haven't processed yet, so they don't know about them. So you're going to have to deduct that $315. That gives you a balance in of $1755. The next thing you do is start with the balance that's appearing in your books, what you show as the bank balance, which is $1698. To that, you're going to add and subtract things that the bank knows about that you don't know about. The bank knows that they have collected interest for you, but you didn't know that. So you're going to have to add $18 of interest. The bank has charged you $6 for a check charge. You didn't know about it. They did. So you have to change your books and deduct that $6. Now the error, that's the interesting one. If you look at letter F in the problem, it says, in the process of reviewing the canceled checks, it was determined that the check issued to a supplier in payment of account payable $316 was recorded at $361. You need to find the difference between $316 and $361. And when you subtract that, you find there's a difference of $45. You wrote it for $361. So you wrote it for $45 too much. So you're going to have to add back that $45 that you took out that you shouldn't have taken out. When you add back that $45 and the $18 and subtract out the $6 check charge, you get the balance to be $17.55, which is exactly the balance that you got from the bank side of it. That's called a two-column reconciliation because you reconciled the bank amount to $17.55, then you reconciled your accounts to $17.55. So you came up with the same amount. So the bank and you agree the amount of cash that you have is $17.55. 55. Now if you look down the page in your textbook on 170 to problem 4, it says to take this bank reconciliation and figure out what kind of adjusting entries you need to make. Now think about that part of it. You don't need to do anything with the adjustments you made to the bank balance. They will take care of themselves. The bank has to worry about those. What you have to worry about are the things that you adjusted to your account. In other words, the second set of information that we had. So if you look back on that slide, you'll see that we had three things that we adjusted. We adjusted for interest they had collected for us, an error we had made, and a check charge. Those are the only three things that we have to make an adjusting entry for. So if you look at the adjusting entries here on this slide, the things that we added, the interest and the correction of the error, we debit cash because we're increasing cash. We credit interest revenue for the revenue for the interest that we earned, and we credit accounts payable because we took out too much of accounts payable. The one item that we did have that in decreased our cash was the charge for checks. You could have a check service charge or a check printing charge or whatever charge that is, but in this case, I just dumped it into a miscellaneous expense. It appears to be a minor amount of money. It probably doesn't add up to much over the year. So I just stuck it into miscellaneous expense and took it out of cash. So the two things that we added to cash are debit entries to cash, those first two, and the one transaction that reduced cash is the credit entry to cash there in the third entry. So those two exercises were to show you how to do a bank reconciliation 
in what had to be adjusted in your books, in other words, your accounting records, to reflect that adjustment. So that's one of the methods that we use for internal control of cash. Now in the next module, we're going to continue with chapter five, uh, chapter 5 and talk about the remainder of the chapter.